faith, it is impo impossible to please God. Did you hear me? Yeah. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those that come unto God must first believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. If you thought you was coming to a nice little pink and rosy church service this morning, you were sadly misled. You have entered into the battle zone. This is a place of preparation where you get prepared to go out into the world from Monday to Saturday and fight off the devil. Now, if you don't believe you're fighting the devil, I will tell you what you're struggling with. You're broke, you're busted, and you're disgusted. You're miserable with life, you're depressed, and you're wondering why am I being ripped to shreds. When people get married, they're in love, hopefully. Then why do they end up divorced? Kids, when they do what kids do, they begin with good intentions or they do this, then why is their life destroyed? Why do people make the decisions that they do that lead to destruction? Because they're deceived. They do not know they have an adversary. You was placed on this earth for one decision. That's to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Amen. If you have not committed your life to Jesus and if He is not your Lord and Savior, He is not your Lord and Savior. There's another one-liner. Don't tell me. You need to be writing these things down. If you've not made Jesus your Lord and Savior, then He's not your Lord and Savior. Which means He's not your Lord He's not going to be taking care of you. You're not going to be serving Him as Lord. And for sure, He's not your Savior. He's not going to save you for eternity or in the situations that you're in. So then, who's that leave you with? It's you and the devil. The only one worse than the devil is yourself. Mm -hmm. You make the decisions that you make in life. If you haven't been taught, then listen, be not deceived, for God is not mocked. Or, that's making fun of God. People don't know they make fun of God. The Bible says, for what so... I'm trying not to yell this morning. Am I yelling? It's just the way I talk softly. <coughs> but listen, he said, for whatsoever a man soweth, this is what he'll reap. If you sow to the Spirit, from the Spirit you're going to reap everlasting life, peace, Love and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you reap according to your flesh, from your flesh you're going you're gonna to sow back destruction into your life. Now to want to destroy yourself, you've got to be a fool. Yeah. You should want the best for yourself. And even if you hated everybody else and didn't want anything for anybody, you usually want the best for yourself. Well, if you want the best for yourself, you better ask yourself a question. Say, self, why ain't I getting the best? If I want the best, what's going on here? There's something wrong with the picture of the world today. People are broke, busted, and disgusted. They have an adversary, and they don't know it. So if you don't know the adversary, I'm telling you, you're getting whooped. You are getting devoured, and you're wondering why. That's our short little intro to the sermon today. Hallelujah! Welcome to church. It's good to have you with us. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 16. We're preparing you to live a victorious life. You need to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. Listen, I didn't care if I made $50,000. It would take $50,001 to make it. If I made $300,000, it would take $301,000 to make it. I don't care what kind of houses I had, what kind of limousines I owned, what kind of businesses I owned. No matter what I did, there was a thief coming after me, devouring and consuming whatever I could build. 
Because I was pretty good at building what I wanted to build. But I had an enemy. And he was stealing whatever I could achieve or attain. Hallelujah. You have an enemy. Kelly, did you know you had an enemy? Yes. See? You didn't even have to hear the introduction. You know you had an enemy. Hallelujah. If you have a phone, shut it off. If you need to go to the bathroom, you should have already went. This is time to be serious for one hour of your life. You don't need to be distracted. I need to have your undivided attention. This is the most serious thing that you could ever hear in your life. These are the words of eternal life. Did I say turn to Deuteronomy yet? Yep. Did I tell you where? No. Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. This is the leader of the household. So if you had a man or a husband and you no longer have a husband, that puts you in charge of the household. You should have a head of the household. If you don't have a head of the household, guess what? You don't have a head of your household. There's another one-liner, so you missed two already today. <laughs> if you don't have a head of your household, you really don't have a head of your household. If you don't have somebody assigned to that position and you know that God has placed them there, there's no head of that household. So if nobody's leading the ship, the ship's just cruising wherever it wants to cruise. Ships are bad when they float around. Just, just floating around, they bang into things, they crash into things. They cause a lot of destruction and they want to know, why am I busting this up? Why am I busting that up? Why is all this always happening to me? Why me? Why always me? Why always me? We need to stop feeling sorry and we need to make changes. Amen. Well, at least I got one guy listening to me. Okay. If you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you got. Never expect a change unless you change. You're never going to get change unless you change. Leanne, how are you doing today? It's good to have you with us. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. That's at church. Get at church. If you ain't at church, you need to be at church. That's the most important sermon I could ever give you. This is the house of God. This is where you come to be trained for battle. This isn't some place you just come to on a Sunday morning, fall asleep, and think God's going to transform you, and you go back and live the way you were living. That's why I never went to church, because there was nothing in church that would keep my attention. I mean, geez, think of what some of the people do at the pulpit. No wonder everybody sleeps. I'd sleep too. I'd say, geez, you better give me something more than that, or I'm going back to bed. First one is at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is the Passover. It is not Easter. Now, I'm not going to beat you up on that this morning. It is the Passover. It is, when, it is when God, for God so loved the world, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe upon Him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus to die on our behalf, so we would not have to die. Jesus is the propitiation for our sin. He is the sacrifice. Because see, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So you have to get that sacrifice in order to be forgiven of your sin. So the Passover was Jesus. God sent Jesus to die for the sins of mankind. The Feast of Weeks, which is the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost was a seven-week period after the Passover. Seven sevens, seven weeks. 
Seven sevens are 49, and the morrow after that, the day after that, would be Pente, the day of Pentecost, when then Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. So we know the first high holy day was when God, the, the, the Trinity, this is how the, the, they're important because the Trinity, the parts of the Godhead, come to the earth. The first one is the Passover. God sent His Son. The second one is the Son sent the Holy Ghost. And the final one is when God Himself comes back in the form of Jesus and the Holy Ghost and they set up their kingdom on this earth. Heaven will not always be up in this place where everything people think heaven is. There will come a day when heaven will come down to this earth. And we will rule and reign here for a thousand years. Then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. But that's enough to give you to contemplate on this morning. So the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost. And the third thing is the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when God comes down to tabernacle with mankind for that thousand year period. First one is Jesus coming to the earth. Passover. The second one is Pentecost when the Holy Ghost came to the earth. And the third one is when they come down to the earth and rule and reign for a thousand years. The three most important times of the year in your life. Now listen. If you didn't know those three days and if you don't know what those three days are, I guarantee you, God's not blessing you like He wants to bless you. God's not protecting you like... He wants to protect you because God's bound by this word just like you're bound by this word. The devil can only have access to your life if you give it to him. Amen. So he says, listen, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty handed. That means you got to come giving. You got to come to God giving God something on these three times of the year. We personally don't need your money. God supplies for us. But God has set up his kingdom, so the kingdom of God must run by according to what people give God. I will promise you something. If you've never given God anything, God's never given you a thing. Everything you've got, you've attained on your own. That's why you struggle. That's why you try to scratch and grab and claw and can. Get all you can and can all you can get, and it's never enough. It's not yours anyway. That's why you continue to lose it. He said, They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed, but every man, every man, every head of the household shall give as he is able. Each person is to give as they are able. Everybody in this room, you're to give as you're able. This is the time of the year. The Passover is coming up, April 23rd. We're having a service at our church. It's the Passover. From that Passover, 50 days after that is Pentecost. If you have never given a supernatural, sacrificial gift unto God, give it during that time. That's a time where you must give. Each one is to give as they are able according to the blessing of the Lord your God which he has given you. Now let's go back to Exodus 23. Exodus 23, verse 17. Exodus 23, verse 17. So these three times of the year, all your males that appear before the Lord, their God, the head of the house. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with, unleavened, with leavened bread, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. The, the, the first of the first fruits of your land. Listen, do I only give to God after I pay all my bills and I give God the scraps? No, God does not get the scraps. Whatever we do, my wife has the checkbook. I say, whatever we do, the first 10% is God's. It's just the rule of the kingdom. 
I would rather have 90% of everything I own blessed by God than keeping that 10%, having 100% of my own $100 and God cursing it. You shall bring this into the house of the Lord your God and you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. It's just the way that the Jews were told to do things back then. So if we do these things these three times of the year, I'm trying to tell you how to bring some protection in your life and some safety in your life and some guidance in your life and protection in your life. The first thing that God is going to do is he is going to dispatch an angel. In verse 20 it says, Behold, I will send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place in which I have prepared. Listen, many of you have been placed by God to be in a job and you lose the job. Many of you have been placed by God to be in a relationship. Many of you have been placed to be at a certain thing in your life. Many people, and you never reach your destiny. Then you go the rest of your life regretting. Why? Because you never reached the place that's been prepared for you. You don't even know how to get there. You have no protection. You don't even know that God's said he'll protect you. You don't even know there is a place to be. You don't even know Jesus is the Prince of Peace. You don't know how to rely on him and to get him to protect you. Verse 21 says, Beware of him and obey his voice. People don't like that. See, you and your flesh, you think you're a little God. That's why we get in trouble. Because we don't listen to God. Yeah. Listen, I can be pretty tough. And I live in the fear of God. Everything I do, I feel fear of God. My back has been broken by God. I have been in the belly of the well, just like Jonah. I have been in those places. I've been in those dark dungeons. I've been in those places where normal people can't even go and function. God has taken me under and held me under until I could hardly breathe. I've learned to obey him. The, the problem with people is they don't know how to obey God. So then they suffer. Verse 21, beware of him and obey his voice. Listen, do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions. He's not going to forgive you for it. There is forgiveness by God through Jesus Christ when you ask him for that. We're forgiven. But when he's addressing you to do something, you better do it. For in my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice, if you obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I, God, I will be an enemy to all your enemies. And I will be an adversary to your adversary. For my angel will go before you and he will bring you in to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and I'll cut them off. Then you shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them, nor do according to their works. But you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. There's a way that we're to be living. We're not to be worshiping other idols. You put anything before God, that's an idol. Then all of a sudden when you get into idolatry, whatever that realm of idolatry is, when you're playing a game with the devil and all of a sudden you go, okay, I'm done, I want to get out. You've already sold your soul to the devil, so you're locked into this agreement, a binding agreement according to the word of God that Jesus is your only answer. So you're getting ripped to shreds, wondering why you're being ripped to shreds and you can't find a way out. Because you don't even know who your enemy is. You think your enemy is your mom. You think your enemy is your dad or your aunt or your uncle or your relatives or your boss or your pe or people that want to bless you. Maybe even the pastor. How insane is that? 
How demonic is that? How crazy is that? You got one person in your life that would be a true man of God that would want to give you the right instruction in the right direction and the way to tell you how to do things and what to do. Just to give you the right direction. And, and you'll think those people are not out for your best interest. But what do you think they want to do? Hurt you? No, they want to tell you the best thing for you. Amen. Let me give you an example. I, I, I touched on this. I touched on this one the last Sunday that I was here. But let's go back to Acts chapter 12. I'm going to show you something today, hopefully. Acts chapter 12. Acts 12. Acts 12. Hallelujah. Acts 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to, see, to seize Peter also. Now this was during the feast of Passover, or unleavened bread. Now why do you think God puts that in the Bible? Just to waste ink? No. Because God knows that there's three days that are called high holy days. One is the Passover, when God sent his son. Two is the Feast of Pentecost, where the Son sent the Holy Ghost. Three is the Feast of Tabernacles, when they come down and dwell, tabernacle with mankind on this earth. The first two have already been fulfilled. We are waiting for the soon return of the kingdom of God to return to this earth. It's very close. Now it was during the days of the Passover, or unleavened bread, the feast. So when he had arrested him, he put him into prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. But Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. Sometimes it's the best place for you. I've been there. I've done that. It said, but Peter was therefore kept in prison. But constant prayer was offered to God for him. By who? By the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping. So the church was praying for him. Peter was thrown in prison. And they're all praying for God to move in his life. They was expecting God to do something great. Now remember, it was the Passover. So they knew to be praying and giving. They know this is a season to be giving God whatever you could give him and be praying to him. To be prepared to receive something great from God. Look, listen. Do you think God's going to bless you when you're serving the devil? <laughs> that would be... Foolish to think that. But the carnal mind, the carnal mind cannot even accept the things of the kingdom because it's foreign to him. So unless a man or a woman is born again and the Spirit of God burst them and they come to life spiritually, they think this book is a closed book. Well, I tried to read the Bible one time like 35 years ago. I couldn't, I couldn't understand it, so I've never read it since. The first thing I said that if you forgot already, I'm going to say it again. Are you awake now? Do this. Yep. Good. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Now, without faith, you cannot please God. For those that come unto God, in Hebrews 11, 6, I'm quoting. For those that come unto God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, you can't even think that. Without faith, you don't even know how to receive direction from God. And if God's not giving you direction, I'm telling you, that leaves you and the devil. And that's a bad combination. 
He's not one to be playing with, trust me. They were about to bring him out that night. Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. They were making sure he did not get out of where God had him. And the, guard, and the guards, therefore, the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, all of a sudden, boom, an angel showed up. Now, I don't know about you, but it takes a lot to get an angel to show up. <laughs> but they knew that it was the Passover season. And they know that if they were praying and giving through the Passover season, the first promise that God gave is that he would protect you by dispatching an angel. So all of a sudden here in verse 7, now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone within the prison. Listen, there are prisoners that are outside of prison. Some of you are captive. Some of you are you're a prisoner to your own lifestyle. Some of you are in prison to a little cigarette stick that somebody told you when you were 10 not to touch that. And then you thought it was cool. So you, oh, that feels so wonderful. Then for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you're trying to stop that habit. You're in prison to that. Some people, it's alcohol. Well, just let me try. Oh, come on. What's a cold one going to hurt? <laughs> cold one hurts a lot of people. It all starts somewhere. But see, Jesus made us these promises. He said, the thief in John 10.10, 10, the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. The devil come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I come that they would have life and have life more abundantly. Jesus wants you to have abundant life. Jesus wants you to have peace, love, and joy. Hallelujah. I'm glad you came to church today. Me too. I got one guy that's happy. <laughs> now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison and he struck Peter on the side and he raised him up. And then all of a sudden, he raised him up, right? And then he said to him, arise quickly. Now, I don't know about you, but if an angel comes over you and just shakes you up in the morning, you're going to be jumping out of bed. Yeah. <laughs> but the angel knew, and Peter knew, that in Exodus 23, 20, that God would dispatch an angel to you. And when he dispatched an angel to you, that you was to do exactly what he told you to do. So in order for that to happen, for those two to dance, two things must happen. First of all, the angel got to tell you what to do. Yeah. I mean, hey, if you've got a bullheaded angel, he may come down and just stand before you and go. <laughs> and then guess what? You're done. Because you don't get no instruction. So then you can't follow what the angel tells you to do. Now the problem with, uh, with many of us today is this. We, when God speaks to us through his Holy Spirit that communes with man now, through the part of the Trinity that God sent the Holy Ghost to the earth now, he's on the present, he talks to everybody. There are times God dispatches angels, but there are times that the Holy Spirit speaks to you and he said, son, go do this. Daughter, go do that. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. Now, when God gives you that instruction through the Holy Ghost, guess what you're to do? You better listen. Because if you don't listen, 
the beating that you're going to take is a lot worse than mommy or daddy ever gave you. But the problem is, is people are not taught this. So they don't know the fear of God. They say, well, God had never hurt me. I got news for you. You ain't serving the same God I serve. Because the God that I serve says, listen, the son that he does not chastise, do you know what the Bible says he is? He's a bastard. That's what the Bible says he is. The son that, the Bible, the son that God does not discipline, that's what he is. But the son that God loves, he chastises. God loves him. Now, many of you are praying to get the devil off you. Well, I'm under an attack. I said, well, really, how do you know that's an attack from the devil? It may be God trying to get you back on the right track. How do you think God's going to get your attention if you're serving the devil? He got to shake you up a little bit. If, if, God don't, if God don't shake you up a little bit, chances are sometimes you can't even make it to church. I know how the way a lot of people are. I've been there. I've done that. Oh, everything's good. I'm in control. Boom, I'm going on my own. All of a sudden, I get beat up and I get thrashed, and then all of a sudden, I need some help. So guess where I'm going? I'm going back to the house of God. It's good to be there. Learn what you got to do and just break, break the insanity. Get yourself right. Live right. It's fun. It's, ha it's happy. Peace, love, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So the angel struck Peter on the side and then he raised him up and said, Hey, arise quickly. And his chains immediately fell off his hands. Then, then the angel said to him, Guard yourself. Well, do you just think this angel just like talking a lot? <laughs> Honestly, angels really don't talk a lot. They're like robots. They come down to the earth, they say, Whom seek ye? Uh, we're looking for Jesus. He's not here, he's risen like he said. They just say what they're supposed to say. So people hear that think they're getting these words from God all the time, and they're like three pages long, and God told me this, and God told me that. Every day God told me this, and God told me that. You, you, you've heard so many voices, you don't even know the voice of God anymore. You'd be hearing yourself, hearing this spirit, hearing that spirit, listening to this, listening to that. Oh, listen, I'll t here, let me tell you how God sounds. So that's how we know how God sounds. So when someone comes to me and says, well, God said this, God did that, and blah, 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 blah. And meanwhile, I know the word because I've been studying this thing for 41 years. So I know you thought I was only 35. <laughs> but I've been studying this thing for 41 years. I got some time in this Bible. Why would I do that? Why would a guy like me study this Bible every single day of my life? Because I know that this book is by far greater than your Facebook account. Boy, it got quiet. If I can get you to put half, maybe a quarter of the time that you put on that stinking Facebook account in the Word of God, then all the friends that you think you have that aren't your friends, you may be able to find some. Just because you have 5,000 friends on your Twitter and Facebook account don't mean they're your friends, buddy. I mean, these great revelations that we get here are just incredible, but you need to understand the Facebook accounts and the Twitters, the Critters, and all the other stuff you're listening to, it's not the truth. I know you think all your friends only tell you the truth. But, but let me tell you this. If, if, and when the chips are ever down, 
you'll find out who your friends are. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll always be there. The angel said to him, gird yourself, tie on your sandals. And then guess what Peter did? So he did. And then he said unto him, put on your garments and follow me. Listen, that's what Jesus is saying today. Many of you curse your own blessings. You can be told exactly what to do. And you could know exactly what to do. But to get your flesh to submit to the will of God, God can give you the most beautiful situation, the most beautiful thing in your life. God can give you a beautiful job that you can be helping the kingdom of God, and then you'll go and just trash it. God can bring beautiful people into your life, and they can be the people that can help you and instruct you and bring you on. And then what do you do? You blow it. God, he places before you life and death. The power, the Bible says, the power of life and death in itself is in your tongue. With this, we speak blessings and cursings on ourselves. We condemn ourselves. Mm -mm. Verse 11, when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel. I don't know what he was thinking before that. Listen, if an angel come in and busted in your room and jerked you up out of bed and told you to put your clothes on, get your shoes on, and got you out of jail, I don't know what you're thinking. I'd be like, thank you, Jesus. He's delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Now let's go over to John verse, John chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Hallelujah. Hey, I preached all night Friday night. I preached till I put everybody to sleep. Then we was up in Cook Forest. We get up early Saturday morning, preached all morning till everybody was hungry for lunch. Then we broke in the afternoon and preached all last night till I could hardly preach anymore. Took a little nap, woke up about 5.30 this morning, and got here this morning, and just giving you everything we got. Amen. So if I appear lackadaisical and tired, I'm not. John 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast. Why do you think that's in your Bible? Because God likes to waste ink? No, because it was a feast. And there's only seven feasts. It's not real complicated. You guys are educated human beings. There's only seven feasts. There's Passover when God sent his son. Feast of unleavened bread when God had to go into the tomb. The feast of first fruits when Jesus had to rise from the dead. The feast of Pentecost, which is when God sent the Holy Ghost. That leaves three more feasts. The feast of trumpets when Jesus is going to return to the earth. The day of atonement and the feast of tabernacles. Out of those three feasts, there are three high holy feasts and you know what they are. If you don't, you are brain dead by now because I've said it one million times. So there was a feast. So I, I wonder about what feast he was talking about. Well, just turn to the next chapter in your Bible, which is John chapter 6, and look at verse 4. Now the Passover, the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. So this is in that Passover season. This is that time of the year when God does extraordinary supernatural things for the people who know that they happen. Listen, when's the last time someone gave you a car? And I'm not into this wealth and 
prosperity and all that stuff. But I'm just trying to show you that there are things that God can do in your life. There are blessings that you can receive from God, but they're supernatural things. See? Carol got one, didn't you? See? Carol got one. There was Bob was in here, the guy that drives the bus. That's why there's a lot of, the, not of our people in here this morning, because he got a car given to him. Who else got a car given to them? See, Terry got one. I did when my husband passed away. Carol? See? John 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Listen, these times of the year, all the Jews had to go to Jerusalem. But God taught us later. He said, these just aren't Jewish feasts. Why would the Jews want to get credit for everything? These are God's feasts. He said, mankind will honor me these seven times of the year. These are things that will be remembered forever. Do you think, do you think that your birthday is so important that everybody's to remember your birthday forever and nobody knows anything about Jesus? You better know something about Jesus. You better know when Jesus was born, and I'm telling you, it wasn't on Christmas, and he's not jolly old St. Nicholas. I hate to burst your bubble, but he's not the fat guy in the red suit. <laughs> Jesus was born on the Feast of Tabernacles. It's October 15th for one week. He was born right there during that feast. And the Easter Bunny and old Peter Cottontail, he can keep jumping down our bunny trail because he ain't real either. We're talking about the Passover and we're talking about things that God told us to honor. Now, if I've stepped on your toes, I'm sorry, but i got to tell you the truth. You'll get over it someday. He said, now John 5, verse 1, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Why would Jesus go to Jerusalem? Because when it was the feast of Passover, every single God-fearing, breathing, oxygen Jew had to go to Jerusalem. On the feast of Passover, on the feast of unleavened bread, on the feast of first fruits, on the feast of Pentecost, they had to go to Jerusalem no matter where they lived. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Beth Bethesda, and having five porches and these lay a great multitude of sick people see people are sick today they're sick mentally emotionally physically they're wounded they've been beat up because we're in a battle you're, you're in a battle even when you know Jesus the battle won't stop you just have the power to overcome the people who don't have Jesus, they're fighting a the battle without the right weaponry. In these lay a great multitude of sick people. They were blind, people who couldn't see. Sometimes people can't see spiritually. They're blind. They're lame people, people that couldn't walk, paralyzed people. They were waiting for the moving of the water. Listen, there are times in your life where God moves the water. There are times in your life where God may speak to you. They're called kairos moments in your life. They are a divine crossroad. They are a time when God gives you destruction. That Listen, this may be the chance of a lifetime for you. You may walk out of here today and get hit by a car. Me and Deborah rode up through Lake Trove the other day, and this girl was sitting on the steps, and her nose was all punched into, the, into her face, and her eyes were all black, and blood's running out everywhere, and there's cops on every single street corner. And I said, well, probably the guy that she really loves just beat her half to death. And then so it turns out it was the guy that was shooting at the cops, and then he killed himself that day. Now listen, do you think that was that guy's intention of his life to someday be beaten up on a girl that at one time he really loved and then to stick a gun inside his mouth and blow his brains out. See, that's reality. Do you think that was his goal in life? No, it wasn't his goal in life. He was placed into a situation where there was so much pressure that he didn't know which way to turn. So he thought that was the only way out. 
When, listen, I'm, I'm telling you something. Hear this. His life did not stop then. His life just started. That young man stepped out into eternity, probably into the wrong place. And he's going to be there a long, long, long time. He is never going to get out of there. People don't like to talk about hell. They don't even like to think about hell. Listen, Jesus talked about hell about three times more than he talked about heaven. Hell is a literal, literal prison of fire and torment. You will be held there forever, and the only way out is Jesus. And Jesus wants to give you eternal life. Why wouldn't you take eternal What What blocks a person? I mean, man, when I heard of that, I go, wait a second. I've been serving the devil not knowing it. I've been serving somebody that wants to take me to hell. And here I got God over here that loves me so much that he gave his son for me. I mean, to me, that's a no-brainer. People aren't as smart as they think they are. I'd be like, man, wake up. You get it. This is best for you. So anyway, they were there waiting for the water to move. And then all of a sudden, guess what happened? Boom! In verse 4. An angel. Well, here's another angel. These are all through the Bible. I could show you these all over the place. But an angel went down. Now watch this, because if you've been trained by me, you're going to know what this means. At a certain time. That word right there, certain time, means that mohadim. A mohadim is a divinely appointed time by God that he is going to send something into your life to give you the chance of a lifetime. To say, listen, if you want to accept Jesus, if you want to turn your life around, if you want a different life, if you want an abundant life, when God is calling you, that's when you jump into the water. You don't say, oh no, I need to do this. Oh, I need to go shopping. I need to have one more cold one. I mean, how, I mean, is that just crazy? That is insane to think what the devil has people conned into worshiping. People believe the lie and they think they're going to get happiness in that. And, what that, and that's what's killing them. That's not where you get your peace, love, and joy. People don't even know what love is today. They get lust and love mixed up pretty easy. Verse 4, for an angel went down at a certain time, a mohedim, a certain time where God is going to do something in the earth, into the pool, and the angel stirred up the water. There are some times where God will stir up the waters in your life. He'll just shake you up. Then whoever stepped in last. No. The Bible says, whoever stepped in first. Hey, I, when we was preaching this weekend, I'm telling you, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, there was an older lady there. She had to be, well, she was older than me. She was 80 some years old. Man, she loved Jesus. I mean, I could just see it in that woman. She was so full of life, and you could just, I mean, it was just bubbling out of her. I just love people like that. They have eternal life. It's within them. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease they had. That's what business Jesus is in. He's in the healing the sick and the diseased people. He's there to heal the brokenhearted. Now a certain man was there. I told you I'm going to do a series on certain men, certain women, certain times. It's all Mohedims. It's all divinely appointed people in times of God. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he asked him this question, which just amazes me. Jesus asked him, he said, hey, do you want to be made well? 
you know why Jesus is asking that question? Because a lot of people don't want to be made well. Listen, some people love their habits. Some people love their lifestyle that's going to take them straight to hell in a handbasket. So Jesus asked him, he said, listen, that's why there's some people I won't pray for. Have you ever had someone come to you and say, oh, will you pray for me? And you go, no. Because that's why Jesus asked him. Jesus didn't heal everybody. You know, you hear people praying. Well, Jesus healed everybody. And Jesus healed everybody. And Jesus, well, no, the Bible tells us when Jesus went back to his hometown, there was many that he couldn't heal. Because they only saw him as the son of Joseph and Mary. And it says because of their unbelief, Jesus could not heal them. Many. That's in the Bible. It may not make you feel good, but I'm telling you, that's why you're not getting what you want. I would, I would rather love you enough to tell you the truth and to have you turn and repent and receive from God and get your life right than to tell you a lie and then someday watch you step off into hell. I'll tell you this. We've been here 15 years. I've done a lot more funerals than I have weddings. Hello. I've buried many people that sat right in your seat. They didn't think it was going to be them either. Jesus said to him, Arise. Well, he said, No, do you want to be made well? Then the sick man answered him, Listen, he said, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Wham, wham, wham. Listen, if you're dwelling in a realm of self pity, you will just stay there in the realm of self-pity forever. Well, why is it always me? And why did this happen to me? And why did that happen to me? And why did this happen? The reason why it happens to you is it's because of what you've done. That's the truth. Because whatsoever a man soweth, this is what that man shall reap. If you sow according to the Spirit, from the Spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life, peace, love, and joy in the Holy Ghost. If you reap according to the flesh, you're going to reap eternal damnation. Things are going to happen not only in this life, but also in the life to come. Because God's in control of this thing, even though you think he's not. Jesus said to him, Arise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, and he took up his bed and he walked. And then that day was the Sabbath day. This, this is why I hate religious people. Oh, I said that I'm on TV. I'm sorry. If you're seeing this on TV, I'm sorry. Religious people are the ones that killed Jesus. They come to Jesus. Now listen, Jesus just healed a guy that was, that was lame from birth. But it was a Sabbath day. So they came to Jesus and they said, this is why we got to watch about the feast days. Because next thing you know, all our people are saying, well, do you keep the feast days? Well, do you have a Christmas tree? Well, do you have an Easter basket? Well, you're not saved or you're saved or they're saved or this. Listen, Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. They were reminders of what Jesus did. Are we going to become a bunch of legalistic scribes and Pharisees? God help us. I hope no, because none of us are perfect. Please understand me. You give people a little bit of truth and then they think they're God. And then they say, well, I don't wear earrings. I said, well, thank God I don't wear them either. I don't wear makeup. 
I said, well, I don't wear makeup either. You get my drift. People think just because they don't do something, then they want to cast that burden on you that you don't want to do, that you shouldn't do what they do. The Bible tells us that these people are ignorant people. They're without knowledge. Why? Because they measure themselves by themselves and they compare themselves to their self. Listen, me and my wife, we had a Christmas in July wedding. Woo! That'll give you something to gossip about. <laughs> Can you believe that Pastor Ruin? He called Santa Claus Satan Claus. But he had a Christmas in July wedding. He don't believe in the bunny either. But he ate a piece of chocolate. I said, I like chocolate. <laughs> Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Every single thing that we preach and teach points us to Jesus. With Jesus, you're in. Period. Without Jesus, you ain't making it. There was a guy one time. You like my stories, don't you? These are my hunting stories. I get these from Greg Turgeon. He tells hunting stories. <laughs> there was a guy that tried to jump the Grand Canyon. He took, whoosh, and he just missed it. But guess what? Whoosh, boom, hit the bottom. And they said, but you know what? He just missed the mark by just a little bit. But the destruction of that thing was eternal. The man died. But he just, that's what sin does. It's not a matter of living your life and being perfect. It's, you, it's your life being perfect as you accept Jesus. And you being committed to serve him. Man, you give some people a little bit of truth about something and next thing you know, that's all they want to do. They think they're spiritual giants. Wow, you know why? I don't have a Christmas tree. I don't worship the rabbit and they do and she does and this and that. And I was talking to one guy this week and I mean, I love the guy. He's a very strong pastor and he, he knows a lot more about the feast than I do and I think I know a pretty good bet. I said, well, I'm going to test the water so probably watch this tape on television or on YouTube, so he's probably going to see this, but here's what I did. I tested the water. I said, well, what do you do about the Sabbath? Uh, uh, well, there's two Sabbaths. I said, hmm, that's interesting. Now, we're not going to be how Jesus wasn't in bondage to the Sabbath, but listen, I've known people in this church that have tried to keep the Sabbath. They don't even know when the Sabbath is because the Sabbath's not Sunday. The Sabbath is on Saturday. That was the Sabbath day. It's the seventh day of the week. And it doesn't start at 6 a.m. It starts at 6 p.m. Friday. And it goes to 6 p.m. Saturday. That you are to do no work at all. Now then the Jews get into this big discussion. What is work? We heard this coming here this morning. Well, is work, um, you're to do no customary work at all on the Sabbath. Well, now is work uh, picking up a bucket of water and taking it and feed your animals? Yeah, so you can't do that. Okay, is work picking up your shoes? Yes, that's work. Is work driving a truck? Yes, that's work. It's work walking up those steps. Absolutely, your body's working to walk up those steps. So then they developed all these laws around the law called the Sabbath where Jesus, here this guy named Jesus came and Jesus said, listen, do you want to be made well today? I don't care if it's the Sabbath or not. Do you want to be made well? And the guy said, yes. And then Jesus said, okay, let it be done unto him. Jesus doesn't want us to be a bunch of legalistic monsters. But do we preach the truth? Yes. Do we teach people the truth? Yes. Do I want somebody worshiping Satan Claus? No. Do I want somebody worshiping a rabbit? No. Do I want them to know the truth in the what the Passover is really about? Yes. 
Do I want them to know that Jesus was born in October? Yes. Do they have the right to choose what they want to believe? Yes. Yes. It's called growing up. Get over your little judgmental self and where you think we learn these things so we could judge one another. That is insane. We need to be loving one another. Amen. That's what we need to do. And all the talking about people and backbiting and all that stuff you hear in every single church you go to, you know what you need to learn how to do? You need to learn how to shut your mouth. That's on TV too. Because listen, if you're gossiping too, you need to shut your mouth. Because the Bible talks about gossip like it's a little spark that consumes an entire fire. No, I didn't say that. She did. No, 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 no. He did. No, no. They said this. She said that. They did this. They did. And everybody's saying everything. So you know what my role is. You know what I do. Okay, we're going to get everybody and they go to Pastor Ron's room. Just like the principal brings them into the principal's room. I mean, how else is she going to put the fire out? Yeah. I say, no, wait a second. She says that you said this about her. No, 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 I didn't say that. I said, well, you told me you said that about... And then, then you see how you quench that spirit. Because it is a spirit. Just like there's a spirit of fear. The Bible tells us God's not giving us a spirit of fear. But of power of love, and of a sound mind. That's what God wants you to have. That's what God wants you to have. People watch these messages all over the country, and I'll get people calling us from all over. Oh, I enjoyed this, or send me an email, or this and that. They're watching us on YouTube everywhere. We want the best for you. We want the best for people. That's why they come to our church. I don't want to tell you what you want to hear. I want to tell you the truth. Because only the truth will set you free. Amen? Amen. Amen? All right, listen, I want every head bowed, every eye closed. I want everybody in here to bow their heads. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you have never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that right now. If you want to change in your life, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I want you to raise your hand. Amen. I see every single one of you. Every single one of you. Lord, I thank you for every single hand that's raised. Now we're going to pray together. Still with every head bowed, every eye closed. I want every single person in here to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father God, I come to you this morning. I am sorry for every sin that I've ever committed. And right now, I ask Jesus to come into my life. I ask him to forgive me and to fill me with his Holy Spirit. God, I trust you. And I believe in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.